Good morning, everyone. Here we are in what we think is our 27th Sunday of streaming. Did we, what did we think when we started it would go on this long? I think we just did not know. Um, and then, of course, we were so pleased when we seemed to get on top of it and hope to even be back together at the end of July or at the beginning of August, depending on medical advice. Well, here we are, second last Sunday in September and still streaming. Um, I think anyone who's watching from Victoria will already know that our number of infections overnight was down to 14. So we are hopeful for a further easing of restrictions from midnight next Sunday. But when I looked at what's proposed this morning, it does mean that we can meet with up to three members of our family, I think, total of five. Um, outside from midnight next Sunday. But we'll just wait and see. And meanwhile, we hope everyone is being careful. What else has been happening this week? Well, our lives have been much the same. Did some more garden and things are flourishing so far. With We've had sunshine and some quite good rain and been watering those plants which don't get the rain, of which there's only a few, and enjoying our walks, and yes, and watching numbers drop overseas, of course, as everyone I think knows. Sadly, numbers are mainly going up. They're having their second wave a bit later than Victoria, and as they head into winter, so that is tough. But the people I keep in contact with are extremely positive and wise about making the most of something you cannot change. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I'm trying to learn to cough the COVID way into my elbow. Elbow Don't always quite get there. And um, yes, and thank you. I nearly forgot. Thank you to all of you who've given us feedback. It's really helpful. We want feedback, positive and negative, um, because the only way we can improve what we're doing is if you tell us how it's going to come across to you. Now, I'm going to stop 10 seconds early because I need to go and suck a throat lozenge. Okay, so Graham will come on. <coughs> Well, good morning and a warm welcome. Thank you for joining us at Blackburn Presbyterian Church this morning. If you've come through the website, uh, we're very pleased that you've found it and we hope that you'll take time to maybe download either the leaflets or the uh, Young at Heart segment, which is now also going to be put on, posted on the web. Uh, we value your comments on Facebook uh, and as Christine was saying, uh, positive and negative, we, we know that we've had some difficulties at various things, uh, especially when we record something and play it through the, uh, the keynote uh, computer. Uh, we often have to rely on the sound being picked up by this microphone before it goes uh, to air. And that's a, a technical complication that we have not transcended. <coughs> so. We pray that as you join us this morning, you will uh, have a sense of being not only connected with uh, fellow Christians, but also that God will speak to you through the things that we share. So shall we begin by praying together now? Let us unite our hearts in prayer. Almighty God, we remember that Jesus prayed that his disciples might be one and that they might mirror the unity of the Father, Son and Spirit. So, Lord, connect us not just uh, across the internet, but by unity of heart and purpose, and lead and guide us by your Spirit. Still our hearts, and draw near now, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now, Amanda is going to play for us a piece by Bach. It runs for about five minutes. I invite you to be still and enjoy the music and reflect about your place before God.
Beautiful, Amanda, and again, um, a beautiful recording. Well, in the last two or three years, Graham and I have learned of childhood syndromes that we had reached past 70 years without hearing of. And this weekend, this week past, we became aware of another. It's got the very attractive name of Tetra Amelia. We love the name Amelia. We have a granddaughter called Amelia. But the syndrome is not lovely. So the topic this week is life without limbs. Nick Vucicic, I'm sorry, I do not speak Serb Serbian, so I probably not said that correctly. Seen in this picture here with one of his young twin daughters. Oh, not yet, is he? Do you want to, is, is he? Yes, there he is, just I'll leave it on that one, please. Nick was born in 1982 in Melbourne. His parents were Serbian, are Serbian immigrants from Yugoslavia. He did feature in a 60 Minutes program in 2018, and some of you may have met him there. We didn't see that program. He was born with virtually without limbs, and this is a feature of Tetra Amelia syndrome. According to his autobiography, his mother refused to see him or hold him when the nurse held her in front of him. But she and her husband eventually accepted Nick's condition and understood it as, and I quote, God's plan for their son. Nick not, does have one leg sort of like a stub and originally the toes were all fused together, but a surgeon's operated so he can use his toes to, for example, grab something, turn a page or do other things. When he was 17, his mother showed him an article about a woman who was playing sport despite having a very severe disability. So he then started to give talks at the prayer group in his church. He went to Griffiths University and graduated at the age of 21, so he hadn't lost time, with a Bachelor of Commerce degree. In 2005, he founded Life Without Limbs, an international not-for-profit organization in ministry, and in 2007, he founded a secular organization, Attitude is Altitude, a secular motivational speaking company. And I think you'll see from the photos, he obviously has plenty finances, which helps, doesn't do everything. And I think that's possibly from this company. There's heaps about Nick on, and his organizations on the internet. He travels all over the world and speaks to people in very varied situations, including in prisons, and he has a delightful sense of humor, which you will see if you look up some of his YouTube clips. He now lives in America with his wife and four children, all of whom have two arms and two legs, and he has two boys and twin girls. And we're about to show you just a few photos which show what amazing things he does with his family. This, I found these, and Graham, my tech man, downloaded them from the internet. It's a seven minute clip entitled Nick Vujicic and Family, 2019 to 2020. And I think you'd actually like looking at the whole series. But now we've got this one, which we found very moving, the one where he's sucking the very obvious finger of one of the twin girls. The next one, they go to the snow. Nothing holds them back. Here you have two little girls quite cold. And now you have him with his sons at the snow. And the next one features him on a sledge. Amazing. 
And then comes a beautiful one of him with one of his sons in the sun beside his pool. And then, and I would like to pause on the next one, the here you see Nick's mother with the four grandchildren she has from Nick. And what I, as a mother and grandmother, found very moving about that, this is the lady who quite understandably could not look at her limbless newborn baby boy and didn't want to hold him. If someone could have told her then where, she, where they, where she would be now, might have been a lot easier anyway. Whatever has happened till now, and Nick has written his life story, here she is, obviously thriving on being with her four grandchildren. And in the next photograph, which is the last we're showing, here she is with Nick and his wife and the four children. So thank God for how far they've come and what they can teach us. And in a moment now, actually, we're going to let Nick, Nick speak to you for himself. Someone asked me, Nick, what is your favorite Bible verse? Well, first of all, uh, many people know that I quote Jeremiah 29 11, that God has a whole plan of future for me. But I also love Ephesians 3 20. Now to him who can do exceedingly abundantly more than you can ever ask, imagine, or attain. And that's when I'm just like, wow, it's, it, it's the factor in anything in life that changes everything. When God's the factor and the sense of point, when you say, God, please be the center of this situation, be the center of this circumstance, be the center of my life, watch out because in his time and in his way, he is a God of love. And yes, he has a great plan, but man, he's a God of miracles. And even the miracles that sometimes we feel like he should be doing or the answers that he should be answering. Um, I just want you to know there is this amazing peace that I hope that you discover in your personal walk with God as you discover Him, look for Him, search for Him, read uh, the Bible and pray that you see that He's a God of peace and He wants you to trust in Him every day, every day of your life. And even when impossibilities come, you tell your impossibilities, nothing is impossible for my God to do. And even if He doesn't change the circumstances, he will give you strength to overcome any impossible situation. Love you. So remember that. Even maybe start memorizing that verse, Ephesians 3.20, and put it in the tablet of your heart. And you can always go back to that verse to remind yourself as far as how big our God really is. Ephesians 3.20. Well, thank you, Christine, and, and thank you, Nick. The Bible verse we're actually going to go to now is Mark's Gospel, uh, chapter 1, and I've asked Sonia to read it. So uh, here's Sonia with the Bible reading this morning. Good morning, friends. The reading this morning is Mark, chapter 1, verses 1 to 15. In the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my message ahead of you. Who will prepare your way? A voice of one calling in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized. 
baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love, with you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. This is the end of the reading. Well, thank you, Sonia, for that reading. Not just from Bacchus Marsh, it felt like we were down by the riverside with John the Baptist. So, thank you very much indeed. Well, we're doing a series of sermons on great texts of the Bible. And I've tried to pick not just individual verses, I'm sure we all have our favourite verses, but I've tried to select large chunks of scripture which show how interconnected the whole Bible is. And today, I want in particular to think of Mark's Gospel, and as our Bible reading, we've just had the first 15 verses read to us. The text of Mark's Gospel is anonymous. It doesn't say who wrote it. You can read the 16 chapters, uh, but you won't find the name of the writer. We, uh, following the early Christian tradition, we believe that it was uh, John Mark, who's mentioned in the book of Acts, uh, and he was a companion of uh, the Apostle Paul and, and had uh, been with Peter as well. And the internal evidence suggests that, and the first century writer Papias, who lived from around uh, 60 to 60 AD to 130 AD, mentions this fact in his writings. So here we are looking at what he calls, what the writer calls, the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I want to just put to you right at the beginning that this would have been in a scroll. And scrolls are unlike modern books. A modern book has a spine which tells you something about it. In this case, the title of the book and the publishers. Uh, mine actually has a, an insignia of, a, of an institution on it. Uh, but inside, you get uh, all kinds of information before you actually get to the book. And if you buy a book across a book, uh, in a bookseller, you'll find a dust jacket or some kind of blurb on the outside which tells you something about the book. You couldn't get that on a scroll. So what tended to happen was the writer of a scroll would put them, all the main ideas in the first column so that you could unroll it a little bit and see what he was saying and you would decide whether to go further or not. Well, when you unrolled a scroll and it said the gospel of Jesus Christ or the good news, you were going to go ahead and sort of find out what this was about. That was his intention. And I'm suggesting that there are four things that we should pick up from these opening, this opening column of Mark's Gospel. And the first of those is that Mark is quite unambiguous about what he has to say. He tells us right up front, this is what it is that I'm writing about. And the second thing is this strange idea of being anointed by God. This is particularly a Jewish idea. And so he's writing for a readership that would understand this idea of being anointed. And, and then I, there are several time references in this, in this uh, segment as well. And so we want to see what, what we're being told about the time. And then finally, we have the first words of Jesus. And those first words of Jesus in his public ministry are, turn and believe. So four points which we'll think about together. First of all then, let's pick up the idea of there being no ambiguity here, no ambiguity at all. This is good news, he says. This is good news. Now the ancient world, just like the modern world, was hungry for good news. Rome sold itself 
as the good news empire. Uh, Rome uh, quashed wars and uh, apart from uh, skirmishes on the frontier in Gaul which have been uh, <laughs> trivialized but made humorous in the writings of Asterix, uh, there was, there was a, a huge area which was called the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. And Rome put down uh, squabbles across the nations it conquered. And, and it brought peace. And this, was, this, they said, was a wonderful thing. Here, here is a Roman denarius, a photograph taken from the British uh, Museum. Uh, and, and you'll see that on one side of the coin, I uh, hope you can see it there, there's, there's an image of Caesar Augustus. That's what it says around the edge. I've, I've written in the U's as V's as they are on the coin uh, in the Latin way. So here is Caesar Augustus. And on the reverse side, is, are these two words which look really odd to us, divus iulius. So this is divine Julius. Julius Caesar had become the, the first emperor. He had re replaced the Roman Republic with an empire and he was the emperor. And he appointed Augustus, who was uh, a designated successor, as his son and heir, as it were. And so Augustus was presented as divine and there are statues all over the Roman Empire which depict Augustus and he was son of a god, that god being Julius Caesar. Interestingly enough the, the message that we get on the coins has been uh, carried further forward by a discovery in this uh, ancient Roman ruins at a place called Parin in Turkey uh, before uh, before the uh, Roman Empire was over, uh, this, this place was uh, built by the Greeks, a uh, Greek-speaking environment, and uh, here's, the, here's the theater there in Paris. Uh, but one of the things that was found there is called the Perrine Calendar Inscription, and it's in the Berlin Museum. And this is what one website says about it. This two-part tablet announces the intention of the city of Pyrene in western Turkey, notice this, to change, to change their calendar so that it begins on the birthday of the Roman Emperor, Emperor Augustus in September. It just so happens we're in September now, the birthday of Augustus. I'm not sure that there are too many people still beginning their calendars today. But from, from them, time itself depended upon the beneficence you know, the, the, the generosity of the new emperor. Uh, near the top of tablet two, in the darkened lines, I don't know if they're darkened on the screen, but they acknowledge that Augustus was the son of God whose birth marks good tidings. That's exactly the same word that, Luke is, that Mark is using at the beginning of his gospel, which you heard Sonia read a few moments ago. The good news, the euangelion for the world. And this was cut in stone in 9 B.C., uh, so those few years before Jesus' birth. And the tablet, it says, demonstrates that the term good tidings or gospel was a political term before Paul or Mark or perhaps Jesus himself decided to use it in conjunction with the message of Jesus. So Mark is not beating about the bush. He's coming straight out and he's saying that this good news doesn't relate to the emperor or the son of the emperor. It relates to Jesus. A, na a name, uh, it's actually, of course, it's, uh, it's a Hebrew name. It comes from the name Joshua. It's the name that God saves. God is salvation. And so here is a Jewish name and a Jewish individual who Mark is identifying. We're calling the writer Mark in conjunction with that early tradition. whom Mark is identifying as the son of God. This is the Son of God. It's amazing that uh, the Roman Empire sold the idea that, that uh, Caesar was divine and Son of God. Um, if you've read Tom Holland's book uh, or seen him interviewed in conversation about it, he quite often says that a turning point for him was when he realized that Caesar, Julius Caesar, when he went through Gaul, killed a million people and enslaved a million more. 
we just cannot understand or comprehend the extent to which the Roman Empire was based on dominant male power. And if you weren't one of those dominant males who were part of the citizenry of the empire, you were servile and subject to it. And the wonderful ruins that we traipse around if we visit Europe, uh, so many of them were built by slaves. And according to Mark, this person that he's telling us about was the anointed one. Let's pick up this idea of anointed by God. It's a, perhaps a little more challenging for us, but I'm inviting you to think about this gospel and to read about this man, Jesus. I said the gospel is only 16 chapters. If you uh, look up the designated reading time, an hour and a half. If you're in Melbourne and you're in this stage four lockdown, why not dedicate, dedicate a quiet hour and a half to reading the whole thing? Not just 15 verses or a chapter at a time. Because if you picked up a book and said, it said, this is the good news, you wouldn't put it down until you discovered what the good news was. So read it. I'm assuming, of course, that you have read it and that I'm going to be drawing some things from it. So the idea of anointed by God well, in Judaism, almost all kinds of things as well as people could be anointed by God. Anointed meant it was set apart for a sacred purpose, for special. And this applied, for example, to the, uh, the utensils that were used in the temple uh, and before that in the tabernacle. It applied to certain roles in, in the life and work of the nation, especially of kings and priests and prophets were anointed. And, uh, and so... In the, in the Old Testament, there was this stream of anticipation that there would some sometime co coming, there would be somebody who would bring the hope that was given to Abraham to fruition. Moses had said years and years after Abraham that God would give you someone like unto me, a prophet like unto Moses would arise. In, in David's day, about 1000 BC, the promise was that there would come a, a savior in the line of David. That God would not forsake the household of David. In the prophetic books we have the idea that someone is going to arise who will do this. That the nation of Israel had failed in its purpose. But yet someone would fulfill for Israel that purpose of bringing hope to the Gentiles. To the whole world. That God's message wasn't meant to be packaged up in a little space in the Middle East. It was meant for the whole world. It was meant for all of us. And Mark is telling us that Jesus is the one who does it. He is the anointed. And he takes us to that scene by the Jordan, which I've already alluded to, where uh, his, his cousin, uh, John the Baptist, had come in from the desert and was baptizing people, encouraging them to wake up to God, that God was going to do something. And so Jesus himself was baptized by his cousin. The other Gospels mention this as well. So Jesus is marked out. He is anointed, but not with olive oil. He's anointed, we discover at his baptism, by the presence of the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And what was that? There must have been people saying, well, I didn't quite get it, but I saw that bird. What? And, and some people might have said, I heard a voice. So what did you hear? What was said? And what was said was, this is my beloved son. Hear him. Hear him. And so Jesus is anointed and declared to be the Son of God. And this political concept is transferred to this subversive message that in time will undermine the whole of the empire and indeed all empire. The climax of the gospel, as you and I know, Jesus died. And what happened there, as Mark tells the story, was that a Roman soldier the man in charge of that execution squad must have taken off his helmet and said, this man, this man was the son of God. This man. So here we have the message. Jesus, who has the spirit of God and lived a life that stood out by any criterion, a unique life. And Mark is urgent about his message. He captures this urgency. I want to pick up on the time references. 
Now, there had been forewarning, as I've suggested. Long years of history had, had already passed. But Mark is uh, a young man, younger than uh, many of the others, in, uh, as far as we understand, if he is the John Mark that is referred to. And he, he just was hanging out for a, a video recorder or a camera, something to catch the action, because he doesn't give us blocks of teaching the way Matthew and, and, uh, and John do. No, he, he gives us Jesus in movement. Again and again, he uses the word immediately. It's only three letters in Greek. So he, he keeps putting it in. Sometimes it's translated as straight away in, in English version. Straight away Jesus did this or straight away he did that. But it's, it's this idea of an urgent forward movement. Jesus in action. And so we're catching the movement. And this subversive message is, begun, is raging through the empire by the time he's writing. It's infecting. Now that's the word that they use. They, they saw it as a kind of virus that needed to be the empire was concerned about it by the year 110 uh, Pliny the Younger is writing in his 110th letter I think it is and he's saying that we think he's writing to the emperor of that day and saying we think we can stamp out this infection that's what they called it he'd found a couple of Christian women and tortured them and discovered what they do these Christians they meet on the first day of the week at dawn and they sing hymns to Somebody called Jesus as if he was God, and they make promises uh, which really amount to living an exemplary life. But we think that this can be stamped out, he says. Well, Pliny the Younger didn't know, but that in uh, the passage of time, the emperor himself would capitulate and discover that Jesus was Lord. This is the urgent message. And, and so it's urgent in the way in which Mark writes it, but it's also urgent in the way Jesus refers to it. Now, how did Jesus know the right time had come? He didn't have one of these magnificent clocks that tells you the year and the season and the time to the minutes and the seconds. He didn't have an iPhone with the calendar on it. But we've got this idea of a calendar reference. Did he have a special watch? What did his calendar look like? Why could Jesus say, and at the end of that passage, the time has come. I want you to notice that the time reference for him was the captivity of his cousin John. John was taken by Herod. And this was the signal for Jesus that the time had come to act. Now, I don't know why that. I think we could maybe find some uh, ideas, but it's not spelt out for us. But it's as if this was the signal that Jesus uh, was waiting for. He knew that, that his message was going to build on what, what John had said. And he had said that there was, among men, there was nobody greater than John the Baptist in the old covenant. But those who are uh, the children of the new covenant have God with them wherever they are. So Jesus is urgent about this. Somehow we imagine there will be another time coming. There will be a time after COVID, we think. We talk about it. But the time to believe is now, Mark says. Now is the time. The prophets had said this. With God you don't put it off. There's a time for closure. And the urgency that Mark is communicating, his own urgency, but also the urgency of Jesus in the words that he's sharing, is something we can sense as we read it. And it's not at that point that we would just say, oh, that's interesting, I'll shut my Bible there, that's enough Bible for today, I'll put it aside. No, at that point we would read on and we would discover that Jesus says, turn and believe the good news, repent. I watched Father Brown last night. It's a television show that uh, is on live to air television here in Melbourne. And Father Brown is a character created by G.K. Chesterton. And one of the things that Christine and I like about this character is that, well, there are several things we like about the show. Um, the uh, dastardly deed is out of the way usually pretty early, and we're allowed to speculate about who the murderer might be. 
And we know that Father Brown is going to solve it. And we know that unlike any other uh, solver of crimes, Father Brown always invites the guilty person to repent. And that's an interesting thing to be reminded of in this day and age. Last night, the murderer was said, you can still repent and find peace with God. Now, that's an amazing thing that the Christian gospel brings to you and to me. A new start. That's what the word, the word actually here is metanoia. It's it, the word noose for our minds. And meta, which means big, it's a big turning, a change, an about face. And in the case of somebody who's guilty of some terrible crime, it's pretty obvious what is called for. But I want to take you to somewhere a little bit different as well. All this week, and for I don't know how many weeks now, our state premier, uh, Daniel Andrews, has spoken to us about the numbers and the situation and the necessity for lockdown. And mostly, and I don't know if, if you're in a household where people discuss what the people on TV are wearing, but you can't help but notice that this top that he's worn is not the only top he's worn, but it seems to be his favorite. Do you recognize it? What's this garment? Well, he's wearing a top that's got a, a brand on it, and the brand is the North Face. Do you know what that's about? It's about the most formidable mountain in Europe, and this company have taken it as their brand name. The mountain, of course, is the Eiger. The Eiger is about four, just under 4,000 meters high, and the north face of the Eiger is always away from the sun. Uh, it's in the northern hemisphere, and so the north face of this mountain is almost two kilometers straight up, if you can imagine that, and it's crumbling sandstone, and it's crumbling because it repeatedly freezes and and thaws, and the ice can continually makes the rock dangerous and breakable. And not only that, but it's susceptible at these heights to rapid changes in weather so that it can become ice covered. And if you're going to climb the Eiger, the most formidable climb is this route up. Uh, if you can see, it's marked in red. And, and this route is, uh, is called the Metanoia. It was named by an American alpinist. Here he is climbing up the mountain. I don't know if you can see him there. His name is Jeff Lowe. And this is him on the second ice sheet in 1991. I'll make him a little larger for you. There he is there. And here he is a little larger on the mountain. Now he was the first person to climb this, this route up the north face of the Eiger. And he got bailed up in a snow, snowstorm and spent many days up on the mountain before people had given up. People had died on this rock face many times before. And, and uh, climbing over ice itself is a challenge, never mind uh, the rock uh, being breakable. But he climbed it and he did make it to the top where he was rescued by a helicopter. Uh, there's a famous film about this climb. And... He named this route, his way up, metanoia. Now, you've heard the translation of that word, repent, turn, change. This is why he named it. He named his route metanoia, and the climbing magazines say it's a Greek word meaning a fundamental change of view or a transformative change of heart. A transformative change of heart. Turn and believe. Well, said Jesus, we're living in a, in a world where we are, kind of accept the status quo. And bit by bit as we grow, we realize there are in inequities. In our, we know there are inequalities from very early on. But as our sense of what is right and just grows and is informed by the understanding that other people are important to God, as important as we are, then we, we start to realize that there are, there are in unjust things that happen in our world. And a free market economy, 
which is what most of us in the West have grown up with, uh, does have the danger of promoting the idea, as the movie, movie Wall Street says it, greed is good. More recently, you may have seen the Netflix, docu Netflix documentary called The Social Dilemma, featuring the very engineers who designed the ubiquitous social networking platforms that we're using right now, Facebook, and all of the others, uh, YouTube, Instagram, uh, Google, all of these uh, are featured, the engineers who designed these things are featured in this documentary, and they're concerned that social media users are being themselves sold to advertisers because they're collecting data about us all the time, and that data feeds into the advertisements that appear on our screen and the things we like and we think we want to hear more of and see more of. And so we become, as it were, the products of the social media platforms. And the, the, the video, the, the movie, the Netflix movie, The Social Dilemma, reveals uh, power that's been concealed uh, at an un, uh, and an, on an unprecedented scale. And I think what we're hearing about TikTok is just uh, a, a symptom of that very thing at the moment. Something has to change to make the world right, to turn it from self-destructive patterns of behavior. And this is as true today as it's ever been. And it's what Jesus calls people to do. So the question is, Mark is fully persuaded about Jesus, but what about you? So we're challenged to read his message and to think it through and to believe the good news. And as you read it through, you'll find questions arising. What is this? Some kind of new teaching? Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? One quarter of the way through the gospel, that's the question. Who is this? Halfway through the gospel, Jesus says to his disciples, who do people say I am? And we hear some of the ideas that are circulating. But he's talking about a kingdom. He's talking about what reigns in people's lives, in your life and mine. And the invitation is to believe that he is the king. When you get to the 15th chapter, you'll find he's mocked as the king. There are five or six different references, laughing, mocking of the king there. But for centuries, this king has been changing the way people think. And I'm inviting you to let him change your way of thinking today. And let him change mine too, day by day. And so the gospel of Jesus Christ brings us to that place where the cross comes through. And we have to ask ourselves, is this our king? Could the person to whom this happened be the one who guides us into our future. I hope and pray that that might be so for all of us. May God bless you. Let us pray together now. As we come to pray, we're reminding ourselves of the situation we're in and of the gospel that brings us hope. So let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the good news that you've sent to us all in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. By your Holy Spirit, grant to us the transformative change of heart that we need. So may our lives reveal that we have truly heard and believed your Son, our Saviour. Lord, we are encouraged that the number of infections in Victoria is trending down. As our politicians, state and federal, seek to restart the productive activities that we call the economy, Grant wisdom to continue to protect the physical and mental health of citizens. We pray for the many services that are called upon to manage the implementation of COVID-related policies. Again, we commit to you, those frontline workers, doctors and nurses, hospital and laboratory workers, police, paramedics, the ADF, and numerous other volunteers. We pray that those who have contracted COVID will regain health. We ask for safety for the elderly and the disabled across the nation, especially for those in aged care facilities. We give thanks that Kirkbrae is now COVID-free 
and pray for all responsible for aged care. We are also concerned about the increasing number of people responding with destructive patterns of behaviour and pray that they will discover helpful and healing ways forward. Help us to promote harmony in our homes and neighbourhoods. As COVID-19 presents a second wave in many places, we ask that things we have sought from you for ourselves will be blessed to all people, wherever they may live. Bring forth good government and wise counsel and improve public health and hygiene. Thank you that so many vaccines have reached stage three trials. As school holidays begin in Victoria, we pray for children and their families, especially in Melbourne, where the five kilometre restriction creates frustration and difficulty. Help children to escape screen captivity Enjoy healthy, active, outdoor fun. Thank you that the relationships between Israel and Bahrain and the UAE are normalized. We continue to pray for lasting peace in the Middle East and for all citizens to be treated justly. Our hearts are heavy as we hear news reports of civil unrest, mounting tensions and violence in various places. We pray that the good news of Jesus, your Son, will continue to spread through the nations, changing minds and transforming hearts in every place. These things we pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. God bless you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift upon you the light of his countenance and give you peace. Amen.